And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, I'm your host, Robert Picto. Before bustling downtown shopping districts gave way to shopping malls of today, merchant associations were commonplace. Merchants would often join together to unify a street with holiday decorations or organize hours and events. Although a store owner would consider a merchant association an added expense, it is one that can yield positive results on the bottom line in the right situation. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 1988. The Service Centre Merchants Association has nearly 60 members. It was formed several years ago when the merchants became concerned after Kitimat City Council decided to build a new public works yard. The existing facility, which houses the district's many pieces of equipment, and contains the various maintenance shops, is located in the service centre. But the council of the day had plans to build a new yard outside the service centre, and that concerned the merchants, who banded together to oppose the planned move. They drafted a report containing three recommendations. One was if, and that's a big if, we require a new public works yard, it should in fact be built in the service centre. Two, that that should not occur unless they've done a, a total cost analysis on the proposed building site so we could actually see if it wasn't a good investment. And thirdly, to compare that cost analysis with the option of buying new equipment, not requiring as much maintenance. That was a very involved report and it was filed with the administration and the council and that was in 18, 1985. And to date, we believe that none of those recommendations have been followed. We don't think the cost analysis has been done. That was in 1985. Now City Hall is pushing ahead with plans to build a yard in the service center area. The public works yard was built almost 35 years ago. It's been added on to, but today the people who work here say it's too small to properly fulfill its function. It's cramped and it's crowded. And when the big pieces of equipment are brought in for maintenance, there's barely enough room for working on them. But it's more than just uncomfortable for the mechanics working here. They say the cluttered quarters are inefficient. Inefficiency is the biggest problem, yes. For instance, the biggest, in my, my opinion, the biggest inefficiency we've got, for instance, if this truck was out of, out of commission right now and we had, to, we had to order parts for it, and the parts were going to be maybe uh, three or four days coming in, we'd have to get this truck and tow it outside, put it on a, on a, on a lot, and then tow it back inside when the, when the parts come in. So that means that we would be uh, time lost getting the thing out and getting the thing in. And if the wheels had to, were to be put back on, then that would mean more time. It would even mean as much as two to three hours lost time just getting the truck in and getting the truck out. There's another factor adding to the inefficiencies of the public works yard. Its facilities are scattered. The tire shop is located outside the main building in a makeshift hut. Across the yard is an old structure that serves as a dry storage area. And to find the waterworks and carpenter shop, you have to go to another annex building this time across the street. In the stores area, the complaint is again about overcrowding. The narrow aisles lead to shelves that stretch to the ceiling, packed with the various articles needed for the day-to-day -day operation of the district. It's the cramped conditions that spawn complaints of inefficiency. It is definitely cramped. We have products in main stores, upstairs stores, back number two stores, we have things in the Quonset hut, and we have things that are outside behind the water bay. And trying to keep track of all of these things would be a lot easier if it was in one location. But while the public works yard is old and perhaps could be a bit larger, the service center merchants aren't so sure if the one and a half million dollars that will go into a new works facility couldn't be better spent elsewhere, such as buying new snow removing equipment, which would cut down on maintenance costs, and keep the aging machines out of the overcrowded mechanics bays. Well, I don't think anyone should build anything unless they've done a, a, a true cost analysis. That doesn't make sense. We don't even do that when we decide to buy a, a new piece of furniture for a house. We all think it through. So they should, we, we think they should have done a cost analysis. Or if they have, in fact, done one, they should release it. We have not got a copy, and we don't know if, that if it has been done. City Hall officials, meanwhile, say they don't need a cost-benefit analysis to see that the public works yard is inefficient, 
and they're also not going along with the merchant's request that the voters decide whether to build a new facility by putting the matter to referendum. I guess one of the reasons is that uh, this has been established as the number one priority of this municipal council. And unfortunately, a public works yard is not very uh, glamorous. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. According to the British Columbia Provincial website, financial budgeting is a planning tool that enhances local government's accountability and service delivery and sets out their legal expenditure authority. Let us return to the archives as the Service Center Merchants Association responds to the district's proposed works yard. While the merchants were concerned about the plans to build the works yard outside the city center area and are frustrated about councils refusing requests for a cost-benefit analysis and referendum, the merchants are now downright angry about where the money for the new yard is coming from. Council is taking the funds from surpluses that have built up over the years in the municipal budget. It's money the merchants say has been socked away by city officials so they don't have to approach the taxpayers to borrow money for the project. And that really is avoiding the requirements of the Municipal Act that says that capital expenditures which require borrowing f borrowed funds should be taken to referendum. So one, in, in any business, one doesn't take working capital and apply it against capital costs. So what in effect is happening here is they're kind of effectively skirting the uh, intent of the Municipal Act? Yes, I think so. Do you think they intentionally over-budgeted? Uh, well, last year they had a five and a uh, $500,000 surplus, and this year they're going to spend uh, uh, a surplus uh, again in excess of that. They're over, you know, that's been over budgeted. So I would say that they're doing it intentionally. Yes. How else would you accumulate that kind of money if you if you weren't aware of it? This is blatantly untrue. It has not uh, been the practice of this municipal council, all previous municipal councils, to salt away funds for future projects. And believe me, if, if, if this municipality was in fact doing what the service center merchant says, they would show up in our audited reports. We would certainly hear from municipal affairs who receive a copy uh, on our, our breakouts on our budgetary process uh, on, on an annual basis. Um, and the, the fact that, that we do not accumulate large surpluses from our operating budget uh, is, is, is in the annual report, you can see it. Well, I think if you're over surplused in your budget, in your operating budget, then that should be applied to your operating budget by reducing your taxes for next year in the same budget. It should not be taken out of that and applied to a capital budget. That just doesn't make any good sense. And so the merchant's concern about spending on the public's workyard spread to an overall concern about the taxing policies and spending priorities of Kitimat City Council. We feel that the amount of money that's spent in the community relative to its size and the fact that the uh, population has dropped 25% in the last six years would certainly draw, have one draw the conclusion that the expenditure of funds is something that has to be uh, done very carefully in all areas and we don't believe that this is being done and we are dedicated to see that it is going to be done. The merchants say they took their concerns to the elected officials but that only led to greater frustration. They say the council and its administration ignored them. In this whole process uh, there has been nobody in council or the administration that's even considered to review what concerns we're putting forward. Uh, they take the approach to attack, uh, to try to uh, react to the individual rather than the concern. And this bothers us very much. For years, Kitimat resident Dave Seri has been something of a troublemaker in the community, often criticizing council. He too is bothered by the attitude of some of the officials. I'm very, very uh, surprised uh, that the Kitimat Council and the administration uh, in this matter of the uh, service center merchants are doing exactly the same as they've always done. 
Instead of attacking the problem, they're trying to attack the personality. It's a feeling that's shared by taxpayer Leon Dumstry Sues. When he wrote a letter to council complaining about the city's expenditures, he got a reply that dealt mostly with the principles of democracy and suggested he run for office. He also feels council is inaccessible. That could be one description of the council, uh, unwillingness maybe, or insecurity to do so, or uh, um, I don't know. It's very difficult to describe this kind of station, uh, situation, and I think it's uh, quite uh, confusing and uh, frustrating for every citizen and for us being in the business in here, and I'm sure for many others. And so, with the service center merchants feeling disgruntled about the handling of their tax dollars and very upset over council's perceived unwillingness to listen to their concerns, they decided to take their fight to the public and mounted an aggressive advertising campaign in the Kitimat newspaper questioning the city's fiscal policies. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. The District of Kitimat Council has one mayor and six councillors. They are responsible for local government services and policies and ensuring the District of Kitimat resources are used for the benefit and protection of its residents. Let us return to the archives as the Service Merchants Association share their concerns. In a series of well-researched advertisements addressed to Kitimat taxpayers, the service center merchants detail a large number of concerns they have with the district's taxation and budgeting practices, spending priorities, and hiring levels. The merchants also made a detailed comparison between Kitimat and its neighbor city, Terrace, which is roughly the same size. It dramatically shows that the Kitimat community uh, seems to require a substantial additional amount of funds to run compared to tariffs. We feel that in that spending aspect, after looking further into this and our own experience with uh, Works Yard and uh, other aspects, uh, we felt that there was some degree of spending that was unnecessary. And we have highlighted this and uh, we have uh, raised the ire of council Kitimat Council is upset over the advertising attack, upset enough to call a special news conference to refute the merchant's charges. And city staff worked for a week preparing the district's own comparison between the two communities. Kitimat officials say the figures the merchants used are wrong. The council that I represent uh, feel are at best uh, misleading at times, and we hope through this package uh, uh, to the press that uh, some of these uh, interpretations can be corrected. We are business people. We do have some knowledge of this kind of uh, uh, activity. And uh, we think that the uh, numbers are reasonably close. But regardless of the difference in figures, Kitimat district officials say comparing Kitimat with Terrace is like apples and oranges, saying the comparisons are invalid because of fundamental differences between the two communities. There is no uh, um, questioning the fact that the municipal budget in Kitimat uh, is greater than the municipal budget in Terrace. This comes about uh, wholly for the simple fact that we have a larger industrial tax base in which to raise those revenues. In general, I would have to say the people that are, that are talking to me uh, in the last three or four months um, are not particularly unhappy with the level of taxation that they pay compared to the level of services that they receive. You don't have an entire business community turned off, an entire community turned off, and expect everything to be roses. I just don't think that they're, they're listening to what they want to hear, and they're not listening to what people are saying. We have not had any negative comments with our approach to question City Hall about tax expenditures. I have not had a single negative comment. All have been positive. That tells me I'm listening to somebody different than they're listening to. Both parties agree they don't see eye to eye on taxation and spending, and probably never will. But some city officials think there's more to the service center merchants' ad campaign than just an overall concern about fiscal policies. They've accused the merchants of working to a hidden agenda. It's indicated, uh, or has been indicated uh, to me and uh, other members of council that uh, perhaps this is the 
start of a, uh, a campaign for uh, the coming up municipal elections in uh, November of this year uh, on behalf of uh, service centre merchants that uh, may be wishing to uh, let their name stand for office. That's, um, I think, what people were referring to. I've heard this term uh, bounced out by a few council members that, that the Service Centre Merchants Association is working to a hidden agenda. What, what might that be? What's your hidden agenda? <laughs> I'm afraid that's news to me. Uh, I, I don't really know what they're referring to. Uh, I assume that they feel that, that we're, uh, as I said before, a small group and possibly a self-interest group, but that's not a fact. Uh, we're concerned. I'm concerned very much on my house taxes, as long as everybody else. Somewhere along the line, there has to be control on spending. We're not seeing that. Kitimat Council does look at the service centre merchants as a small self-interest group and weighs their concerns accordingly. First of all, uh, the number of people that are part and parcel of the Service Centre Merchants Association represent a very, very small percentage of the to total community. Uh, not to say that it's just a numbers game when you listen or you don't listen, but they are a small percentage of the overall community. And it's Council's job to listen to all the concerns of the community, take that information and base your decisions on those concerns of the whole community. They've made comments in regards to we're a small minority group. Uh, this is quite true, we are down here. We represent approximately 58 businesses. However, collectively, we are the fourth largest taxpayer, the fourth largest employer in Kitimat. As well, we probably know more of the activities of the municipality than any other group in Kitimat. Despite the extensive advertising campaign undertaken by the service center merchants and the media attention it's generated, many Kitimat residents aren't even aware of the simmering controversy. Are you aware of the service center merchants association, their ad campaign? No. Never heard of it before? No, I just heard it on the radio. Something about this woman's going to have a talk show at 930 and we can phone in and comment, but I don't know what they're talking about. No, I'm going to move out of here, so I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't care either. Have you been hearing about the concerns of the Service Centre Merchants Association in the newspaper? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you I heard about it. And Do you share some of their concerns? Of course, the concern of them is also our concern. And, uh, and uh, we just hope that they could do something about it. So you um, think there could be a little more responsibility at City Hall? Mm, exactly. Well, certainly some of the information that's been published uh, causes concern, yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether our citizens' expectations are too high or whether the money's not being properly administered. But I think the fact that it's happening shows a frustration out there that has to be addressed by, by Council. As it turns out, Kitimat Council is addressing the frustration of the merchants. A special public meeting was scheduled for Thursday, March 10th at River Lodge, where Council and the merchants can each put forward their position and where the public can act as the judge. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Icebreakers are often described as ships that drive their sloping bows into the ice and break it under the weight of the ship. In reality, this only happens in very thick ice where the icebreaker will proceed at a walking pace or even have to repeatedly back down several ship lengths and ram the ice pack at full power. In this final segment of Open Connection, we return to the archives with the captain of the Martha L. Black. We had some difficulties off Point Barrow in the Chuck GC area, and that was in late September. And after some difficult fighting with very heavy ice, up to 30 foot in thickness, uh, and with the assistance of the other Coast Guard icebreaker, Pierre Radisson, stationed out of Quebec, and with the additional assistance of the Polar Star, stationed out of Seattle, a ship, uh, largest uh, icebreaker in the free world, a ship of 65,000 horsepower, all three of us were unable to round Point Barrow and head south in the Chukchi Sea. So on October 1, we all turned east and routed uh, back to our respective home ports uh, via, the, via the Northwest Passage in Halifax. 
The trip to Halifax took 10 days, and the 40-member crew had some time to videotape some of the Arctic's stark beauty, including sightings of Arctic polar bears. This is a rather unusual trip. I, I take it that the black has never been on that side of the continent before. Well, that's right. She's only uh, two and a half years old, so in fact, she's just come on three years old now. But uh, that's... It's very unusual. For 28 years, we've been providing... The west coast of Canada, western region of Coast Guard, has been providing icebreaker support for the West Canadian Arctic and for all ships uh, entering the West Canadian Arctic. And that's the first time in 28 years that we've been stuck with such intensive ice conditions off Point Barrow. While in the Arctic, Hurricane Gilbert swept Hurricane across Gilbert the Caribbean, devastating Jamaica. Jamaica. This gave the 83-meter icebreaker an opportunity to undertake an unusual mission on an already unusual trip. We spent 19 days in Halifax uh, Industries dry dock repairing damaged propellers from the ice off Point Barrel. And uh, in the process of doing that, uh, Coast Guard headquarters was in touch with me and solicited whether we were interested in being of assistance in providing delivery of a relief cargo down to uh, Jamaica because they'd been struck by Hurricane Gilbert in September of 88 and uh, there was extensive damage all through the cities and outlying communities in Jamaica. And uh, knowing the crew well, I said, no, we'd be delighted. Uh, even if it did uh, impact on our arrival date back in Victoria, the crew would have been delighted to provide that kind of assistance. And so uh, everybody dug in with a great spirit, and we spent uh, then seven days loading cargo for Kingston, Jamaica, in Dartmouth. And after six days of steaming down through the Caicos and Windward Passages, we arrived in Kingston on November 22nd and uh, then offloaded cargo, the relief cargo that we delivered for some six and a half days. We took down uh, about 350 tons of cargo, which amounted to over 15,000 boxes of various supplies. The ship left Dartmouth on November 15th, carrying medicine, clothing, grain, and other relief supplies. Offloading the much-needed cargo took six days in Kingston. On November 28th, the Martha L. Black left Jamaica for the Panama Canal. It was rainy season, so uh, it certainly dampened the spirits of going through the canal. Uh, we went through Catan Lock, which lifted us 85 feet into Lake Catan in the wee hours of the morning. However, the canal is well lit these days, so everybody had a good chance to see it happening. And uh, the following day, we went down through Gillard Cut and uh, then through the Pedro McGill Locks and the Miraflor Locks. And uh, that was in the brightness of day, even though it was raining very hard at times. But the crew, I think, enjoyed it. Certainly a, a, a contrast to our, you know, our activities in the Arctic. And uh, the warm temperatures certainly suited everybody fine. And uh, from Panama up to Victoria, we had a very nice passage. We had some gale force winds in the Gulf of Tuanapec. And then when we got just to the south of Frisco, we got into a full storm. Uh, but other than that, it was basically uneventful. I, Took the ship in very close to Acapulco, and the crew could see what it was like to uh, uh, what it was like in a resort area, well, well known. And we had the Mexican Navy offer us, uh, uh, extend us an invitation that the next time we were down, they would give us uh, a tour of the city, etc. But uh, we were well, well received. It was a long, strange trip for the ship, its officers and crew, from Arctic ice to sun tanning on the deck. But Mella says everyone was happy to be back home in Victoria, where family and friends were eagerly awaiting their return. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Bechtel.